Thank you very much, Pietro, for your kind introduction. I'd like to thank the organizers for allowing me to be here with you today, and especially Pietro for insisting and making it possible, as well as Deborah, for me to be here. It's always a pleasure to be in this city. I have lived and worked here in Barcelona for many years, and I'm very happy to be back. This is the institute where I work, funded by Jonas Salk, the discoverer of the polio vaccine about 60 years ago. His motto was, try to understand biology so that we can help clinicians. And that's what we do, and I'm going to try to give you a summary of a few things that could be of some thoughts for you and that maybe in the future could be of utility for your daily work. Um, if we can switch off the, the sound, thank you. So regenerative medicine in the last 10 years has been really a success. Today we can generate, for instance, cardiomyocytes. You can see thousands of them here beaten in a petri dish from a single hair. We can generate uh, neurons that produce dopamine and that could be used for transplantation in patients suffering from Parkinson. Not only that, just cells, but even these mini organoids, mini kidneys, mini eyes, mini brains that could be utilized as well for transplantation. This is something we could not have imagined 10 years ago. And I would say that all these advances mainly have helped to understand a little bit more organogenesis, how an organ is formed, to better understand specific diseases. And we are now at the stage of finding new drugs that can alleviate diseases in vitro. However, the use of these cells or mini organoids for transplantation, I feel is still far away. So the problem, I will pinpoint the problem to the last stages of maturation of these cells. We do this experiment by trial and error. We add to the Petri dish factors with the hope that they will make the cell type that we want. And I feel these last stages, we cannot still imitate nature. So for that reason, and in parallel to these studies, um, we are, as I say, we are far away from making an organ in the lab. We decided to uh, look backwards, and, and I'm going to tell you something that is very familiar to you, the idea of xenotransplantation. Having an animal like the pig that we could use the organs of that animal for transplanting it to the human. Humanizing an animal. And for that, we have two approaches. To humanize the animal with cells and to humanize the animal by altering its genome. I'll tell you a little bit about humanizing the animal with cells. For those of you who have been here about an hour ago, you have heard a wonderful talk by my collaborator, Dr. Pablo Ross, who has introduced and explained the idea, which is mixing cells from different animals. Here we are mixing cells from a rat and a mouse. Here is the blastocyst of a mouse, and in red you see rat pluripotent cells. If you leave these blastocysts develop, what you see is that the mouse now contain red cells, rat cells that have incorporated into the normal development of the mouse and are participating of the different tissues and organs of this mouse. If the mouse is born, you get this animal. I don't really know what this animal is, a mouse, a rat. I tend to say that is a mouse, because in the animal facility we pay less for having a mouse than a rat, but I really don't know. What I know is that probably is the oldest chimera today living, and that it 
the idea of, of mixing cells seems to obviously work. Now, the problem is that if we do this experiment again, probably the end result will be different. The red cells will be here or there. So if we want to specifically get an organ, we need to do some tricks. Pablo Ross mentioned this morning the tricks which basically is to alter the genetic pathway for the cell type or organ that we want to obtain. Let's imagine we want to obtain a pancreas. What we do is eliminate one of the genes involved in the formation of the pancreas, in this case, the PDX1 gene. By doing this, and after introducing the rat cells, what we get is a mouse with a rat pancreas. This can be extended to other tissues. For instance, we eliminate a gene that is critical for the formation of the heart. As such, the heart is not formed, the embryo stops developing. But if now we introduce rat cells, you can see that the embryo continues developing, and then most of the heart cells are coming from the rat. Another example is the eye. If we eliminate the eye of a mouse genetically, we can see that after introducing rat cells, most of the eyes of this mouse are composed of rat cells. Now, the problem is the size, as we heard this morning. The horse determines the size. Therefore, having a mouse or a rat growing human organs will not be of too much use for you. We decide to move to the peak. You can see here a few human cells being introduced in a peak early stage of a pig embryo. These cells divide, and later on, during development, you see a few hundreds, thousands of cells growing in the pig. The problem is that if we compare this experiment with the mouse rat, the efficiency is very low. There could be many reasons. We are separated from pigs by many, many years throughout evolution. Ma mouse and rat are much closer. It could be the cells that we use, the donor cells to introduce here, they don't have the ability that the mouse or rat cells have to colonize the mouse or rat embryo. So there could be many things. Some of the experiments we are doing, I'm going to present them to you in a moment. What about if the problem is the cells? That the cells that we are introducing are, don't have that capability to make a good chimera. If we look at all the cells that uh, different labs throughout the world have captured from the human embryo, they classify around these stages. And these are the cells that we have been trying to inject in the pig. So what we have done is to move a little bit earlier in development and a little bit later in development. So let me talk about later, progenitors. About eight to 10 weeks, this is the human embryo. And in that human embryo, you start to see the progenitors of most of the organs that will appear in the adult. Let me make a detour just to stress the importance of progenitors. These are animals that have an extraordinary ability, which is the ability to regenerate their tissues, something that mammals, in principle, we don't have that ability. If I can have the video, please. Here you see that if you cut the limb of this animal, the Mexican axolot, the champion of regenerators, you can see that in about three to four weeks, the limb start growing back, and the animal regenerate a limb with the same number of digits, same pattern, same function. And if you do this again and again, it will regenerate. So we have been occupied for the last 20 years trying to understand how this animal have this extraordinary ability. It happens that, contrary to what we have studied in the textbooks, mammals do regenerate as well. But they only have this ability 
at the, at the embryonic stage or just a few days after we are born. Here you have an example. Two or three days after a mouse is born, if you cut a piece of the kidney, you wait for about two weeks, you cannot distinguish the kidney that was cut versus the control one. This happened with many other organs. So regeneration is encoded in the mammalian genome. It's just, it gets um, switched off as we grow. Now, how does this work? Well, the combination of the study in these animals that have this extraordinary capability at the adult stage, with the combination of these neonatal studies in mammals, have given us a picture that can be summarized in this slide. So you have cells that cannot proliferate. After the amputation, what happens is that these cells, they differentiate a little bit backward to a stage that we call progenitor-like stage. And it's at this moment when the cells are able to proliferate again and then execute their regenerative program. The irony is that the cells never go back to a pluripotent stage. So we have been working for so many years, and what nature does in regenerative medicine is never going back there, but just a step backward. This is just to highlight the idea of the progenitors. Nature used progenitors for regeneration. Let me tell you another experiment that really speaks quite highly about progenitors, aging. We know that after a specific time point in our life, disease appears and has really an increase, say, between 40 to 50. We can see a high incidence of the appearance of all these diseases. Now, in order to to try to study aging in the lab, we use different model systems. Here there is one. These kids have a particular mutation that makes them um, age in an accelerated way. This one here, the oldest, has only 12 years old. It will die about 14, 15. And this is a mouse model that was generated by Carlos Lopez Otín here in Spain that phenocopy the same phenomenon in mice and is quite useful for, under, for trying to understand aging, but the point I want to say is the following. So if we take this mouse, the mutant mouse, uh, as you know, a mouse in the lab lasts for two years, more or less. This particular one, it lasts for two months. If you take this mouse, and now you apply the four Yamanaka factors, and I just want to remind you what this experiment is. Applying these four factors, what make is to remove many of the epigenetic marks that a cell has accumulated with time. So this is an epigenetic experiment. And we, instead of going back to pluripotent stem cells, we just apply the factors so that they stay there for a little bit. And that little bit brings the cells to a progenitor-like stage, like the salamander or the Mexican axolot. And what happened is that this mouse rejuvenate. This mouse now leaves 30 to 50% more. And all the organs we have looked at, they have rejuvenated, and in many circumstances that I don't have time today to explain, some of the diseases and when we do this in a wild type background, take longer to appear. But the key message I want to say with this experiment is that the reprogramming happened just to an earlier stage, to a progenitor stage. If we do the reprogramming until the end to a pluripotent stage, this mouse will die. In fact, it dies after two or three days if the full dose of factors is there. So progenitors are important. And finally, <clears throat> I don't need to tell you that progenitors are used in the clinic every single day to save lives. So we thought that for the peak experiment, 
where we are using cells, human cells that cannot contribute to higher proportion of chimera animal, why not to use progenitors? For that, we take a human embryo about 10 weeks old, and we know that organs develop from specific progenitors. In the case of the kidney, there are two cells that are responsible for the more than 30 cell types that a kidney is composed of. This is how normal development of the kidney take place. And what, <coughs> excuse me, what we have done is trying to imitate this process in the Petri dish. As you can see here, we were, were trying, we are not still there. But one of these stages here, depicted here in the Petri dish, with, you can see that we can start to visualize these early morphogenetic steps. This is a little bit later, and this is what we obtain in the Petri dish. But more importantly, when we take these progenitors and we put them in a kidney, you can see here the red dots are the cells that we put there. These progenitors are able to differentiate in situ into the major components of the kidney. So progenitors, when put in the right environment, could do the job. So that's why we decided to use these progenitors to inject them in a different animal with the idea of seeing if they could make better chimeras. This is a rabbit. We're doing this in rabbit and pigs. So we take, we expose the uterus of the rabbit and introduce these progenitors. Here you can see a kidney. This is the needle entering there. This is an experiment that is done here in Barcelona by the team of Dr. Gratacos. And we are at this moment at the early stage of this experiment. I am quite confident that based on what I have shown you before, the importance of progenitors, this could be useful. One advantage is that tumors will not be generated. We are not injecting pluripotent cells. We are injecting a cell that already know what it has to do. Now, and the other idea is, well, if all these cells do not work well, why don't we move a little bit earlier in development? Trying to get not just a pluripotent cell, but a totipotent cell. So we have been working on this with different collaborators for the last few years, and here is an example of such a cell. You see a red dot here. A few hours later, you see two red dots. These mark the two parts that make an animal, the embryo proper and the trophoblast derivatives, like the placenta. So if we were to use today any of the cells that have been produced, any of the pluripotent cells that have been captured in the laboratory, and we this, do this chimeric experiment, you see that the best cell will generate an embryo, but will not contribute to the trophoblast lineages. However, with this new cell that we have captured, you can see that besides contributing to the embryo, it's also able to contribute to the trophoblast derivative. It can just one cell can make an entire mouse by this tetraploid complementation experiment. So the idea is that maybe these cells are better than the one we were using before. You can see it here. So there is no chimerism with this type of cells, a little bit of chimeras with this type of cells, and you see much more with the new cell type that we have been able to capture. So let's go back to the issue of xenotransplantation. So the idea, as I mentioned before, is to humanize a pig, to humanize with cells, to humanize with gene editing tools. So we really need good cells. I have mentioned a new cell type that could do the job, and we're injecting right now this cell into pigs. But another key aspect for humanizing the pigs 
is to modify their genome. Right now, the way this is done is by cloning, which is a tedious procedure. So the possibility of having pluripotent stem cells in the pig or in any other animal will certainly simplify the procedure. And Dr. Lombardo has given us a wonderful talk on how the genome of a human cell or a human organism or another animal could be modified. Let me tell you a little bit more. Just to put things in perspective. So the first pluripotent cell was captured from the mouse in 1981. And this is not an easy experiment. It has taken about 27 years to obtain a rat pluripotent stem cell. It is true that in the way we have obtained human pluripotent stem cells, but these cells, as I have shown to you, they are not really equivalent to these two cell types here. So this idea of generating and capturing pluripotency in vitro is not that easy. Ideally, we would like to capture pluripotent cell from this animal so that we could humanize them. And that's where we are now. I have mentioned briefly these new extended pluripotent cells. We have got them now in rat, in monkeys, and in pigs. But let's move now to the gene editing tools. As Dr. Lombardo has mentioned, the two main um, mechanism by which the genome is repaired is using these two pathways, the non-homologous engineering pathway and the homologous recombination. He has given us wonderful examples of knockout, knocking that can alleviate disease. Now, this other pathway which is active in cells that do not divide, we thought that could be used to do something we cannot do today in cells that do not divide, which is introduce pieces of DNA, knocking. If we were to do a picture of any one of you at this moment, a BRDU picture, 90% of your cells do not divide. And therefore, the risk of having a disease is more, is higher in the, in the number of cells that you have in this 90% rather than the 10%. So technologies where we can manipulate the genome of cells that do not divide are required. We recently published a technology that can do this. Let me tell you a couple of examples. For instance, a mutation in a gene that causes blindness. These kids start to lose their vision and at the end they don't see. There is a rat model that has the same mutation and has the same phenotypic aspect as the human. So here is a rat, a wild type rat that can see perfectly. It's a stimulus of light, no light, and the rat just turn around her head to see this stimulus. Now, this is the wild type I well can we go backwards a little bit before? Hmm. Mm, okay, let's finish this video. And this is the wild type rat. Now we can see here the wild type I produces the protein. The mutant doesn't produce the protein. After applying this technology, we see part of the protein is produced again. If we now click this video, please. This is the treated, the, the treated rat. Now, the treated rat try to see uh, what is happening. Even if we turn this around, now the rat will turn around. So if we move to the next video, this is something that a blind rat will not do. This, uh, can we skip this, please? 
Thank you. The first one on the left, that one, yes. This will just be the blind rat that cannot see at all, and obviously the stimulus uh, has no effect on this rat. So basically this technology allows us to improve the vision of an animal that doesn't see by the reappearance of the protein. And we can do the same thing with this mouse that I showed you before. That was a local delivery, and this is a general delivery in the mouse. And immediately you will see, if you can please click the video, out of the two brothers, which one was treated. This is about two months. This is the non-treated one. It is going to die in about one day or two. And this is the treated one. And this is alive and happily still. So this technology can be used to treat either locally or systemically to correct a specific mutation in cells that do not divide. But what happened is that this technology is quite good for cells that divide. So this is more or less the efficiency of the homologous recombination technology that we have today in the lab. <clears throat> if you look at this other technology, the HITI, the bars are much, much higher. Therefore, technologies like this and others that we and others are developing could be used in order to try to humanize the peak immune system. Dr. Lombardo has mentioned, yes, let me go backwards, has mentioned about nucleases, talent, CRISPR, thin fingers, but there are many other tools, integrases, transposases, recombinases, by which we can, at this moment, try to modify the immune system of the peak. And therefore, and this is my final slide, together with the humanizing of the peak system with cells, the possibility of xenotransplantation is something that we should not avoid. I know that for some of you that have been long time in the field, you may think xenotransplantation is the future and will keep forever being the future. But at this moment, we have technologies that can help resolve some of the key problems of xenotransplantation. And the idea is summarized in this slide. I have shown you that we are deriving cells that have an extraordinary chimeric competence. We are deriving cells that we can engineer to write or rewrite the immune system of the pig. And as such, produce pigs with organs that could be immune compatible with humans. At the same time, I have mentioned the possibility of not only rewriting organ development in these animals, the pig or any other host animal, but the use of cells that could, in principle, help humanizing the organs of these animals. Cells that come from the person that needs an organ. I feel that the combination of these technologies, the writing of the genome of the pig, the humanization of the pig with human cells, may contribute to help the problem of organ transplantation. And finally, the most important slide of all is the people who have done this work. I have the honor and the pleasure to collaborate with many laboratories. Dr. Pablo Ross here has introduced and presented to you some of the experiments that we're doing together. The experiments regarding the injection of progenitors are done in collaboration with Dr. Campistol and Dr. Gratacos here in Barcelona, Dr. Martinez in Murcia, and La Jara and Núñez in, in Murcia as well, and the pluripotent new uh, cells are done in collaboration with Dr. Hong Huiden in Beijing. I would like to say the name of all 
the people in my laboratory. I don't have time. Just want to say thank you to all of them and thank you for your attention.